Um, praise God. Well, we are in the middle of our series, Blessed. Blessed. And um, th- this whole series is based on the nine sayings of Jesus known as the Beatitudes. Beatitudes comes from a Latin word that means blessed, basically. And I was thinking about today's Beatitude and uh, got me thinking about shopping. I, I think about shopping a lot because I do a lot of shopping, right, at, at, Wool- at Woolies just down the road here. Or maybe you'll be, yours is Pack and Save or, or yours is New World, um, whichever it is for you. But, uh, but have you ever been behind someone in the 12 items or less and you glance over and you, go, you look at their basket and you're like, these guys have more than 12 items. In fact, they've got 25 items. How do you know? Because you counted. You counted. And you know what's so funny? You're counting their item. Someone's counting yours <laughs> behind you. <laughs> they're counting, and, and they're all counting like this, right? And, and here's the thing. You're, you're behind someone. They've got a lot more. They've got 25 items and the 12 item or less in there. And you're thinking, look, go in that line over there. What are you doing over there? Then they turn and they give you like a cheeky smile. And you go, oh, now it's on. Now it's on like King Kong, and I, I'm not sure how, how I'm going to throw this down right now. And, I, I, and I've got a choice. I'm going to like throw it down like, like, like I'm going to roll my eyes. So you know, and I'm going to sigh dramatically. <sighs> so you know this is how I'm going to throw it down, right? Or I'm going to just shrug my shoulder and just let it go. Let it go. Let it go. Let it go. Anyway, I'm going to re- come up with a new song. We've got these choices. It's, it's really funny. It's really interesting how little things, little moments can test our patience, right? More than that, it can test our mercy, our mercy. It's really interesting, like the smallest thing, like grocery store etiquette. Like, right, like there is a thing, because we all know there's an etiquette when it comes to shopping. <laughs> there's an etiquette like, wait, hey, um, excuse me, I'm standing here. Can you see me? Um, oh, you've been a little bit too close. Or, um, or you're standing behind someone and, and they, haven't put in, they haven't put that um, uh, next, that divider. And I go, are you going to put the divider? You, don't you know the grocery store etiquette around here? You've got to put the divider there. You haven't put the divider there. This, has no one told this person? There's an etiquette around shopping. Right? We all know the rules. All right, it's the unspoken rule, but right, well, all these, it's really interesting that, that something as small as grocery store etiquette, it can reveal the biggest truth about how we treat others. Isn't that interesting? Let's be honest. Mercy is easy to talk about, but it's hard to practice. It's very hard to practice, whether it's forgiving a friend who's let us down or, or helping a stranger in need. We often feel the pull to, to hold back, to keep our energy our time, our forgiveness to ourselves. And the reason why is because, because mercy costs something. And if we're honest, sometimes we feel like we've paid enough. We've paid enough. You know, someone else. I've shown a lot all my life. I've shown a lot of mercy. And I, to be honest, I, I've noticed something about me. I've noticed the older I get, the older I get, the grumpier I get. Someone... <laughs> <laughs> someone, someone, someone said it's actually a thing. It's called um, a gom. It's called a gom. It's called um, what? What does it stand for? Getting old. A grumpy old man syndrome. I didn't realize it was a thing, but apparently it's a thing. All right. Well, t- today's message is how you can be free of that, which is why I'm speaking to myself right now. Because the reason being is because we feel like we've paid enough throughout our life. We've done our due. It's time for someone else to show mercy. I've done it all my life, and so someone else can do, and which is why I'm getting a bit grumpier. Someone else can. I've, I've, I've let people cut in front of me while they're driving, right? I, I'm a saint until you get me behind a wheel. Does anyone know what I'm talking about? Yeah, someone told me about this. I'm not sure. I just raised my hand. Someone said that. Uh, but here's the thing. If you've ever parented a toddler, you know what mercy looks like, or, what, or, or at least you know what it should look like. Right, So when, you, when your toddler spills an orange juice all over the carpet, you've, you've got a couple of options. You can either yell at them for the mess they've made, or you can bend down, pick up a paper towel, dry up the mess, and say, it's okay, accidents happen. Right? This, this, right? Mercy is messy. It's not always easy, but it's those moments that teach us what love really looks like. And there are times as a parent we fail miserably at it. Um, which is why we've had seven children, so we got, got better at it. My, my, my daughter, who's the second youngest, she says, why are you, you, you don't 
to Putty, he's, he doesn't get what we got. And said, well, that's because you guys, we finally figured out when we got to him. Finally figured this out, and you guys were just a practice run. Well, no, just kidding. I've got, it's not, I, 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 honestly, I did say that to my daughter, but we've got this, this weird humor amongst us. Anyway, <laughs> keep moving on. Keep <laughs> Mercy is messy is what I'm trying to say. The nine sayings of Jesus, the Beatitudes, can be divided into three groups of three. And uh, we've already begun the second triad. And if the first triad is where God finds us, he finds us where, where, where we are powerless, where, where we are grieving, where we are unimportant. If the first triad is where God finds us, well, then the second triad is the type of people that God, that God wants to produce or the type of people that God is developing us into. That's what the second triad is all about, is, 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 is the vision that God is, is growing us towards. He's forming a people that are that hunger and thirst for righteousness, that show mercy, and that they're pure in heart. This is the type of people that God is forming. And this is what the second triad is all about. So today we're going to be looking at the good life is for the merciful. For the merciful. For they will be shown mercy. The good life belongs to those who are merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Now here Jesus uses the Greek word alios. Alios. Everyone say alios. That's a cool name. You know, if someone's going to have a baby, this could be a name for you, Elios. <laughs> okay, anyway, Elios. Uh, this word Elios, it holds this deep meaning. Like, like Jesus begins to, to unpack this meaning of Elios when he begins to share this parable of the unforgiven servant. And if you're, familiar, and if you're Bible reader, you'll, you'll be very familiar with the story. It's, it's found in Matthew chapter 18, verse 21 to 35. Now, in the story, there's a servant who owes a huge debt. It's a type of debt that was going to take a lifetime to pay. And the king shows mercy on him. The king shows mercy on, I just saw my grandkids. Hey, there they go. The king shows mercy on, on the servant and forgives him of all his debt. And so you will think that the servant, this, this, this servant, you'll think that he will then go show mercy to someone else, but he doesn't. And when you read the story, there's, some, there's another servant who owes this servant who's been forgiven a small amount on debt, very small. And, uh, and he punishes him for not paying this debt back. And when the king finds out, he's outraged. He's outraged. And he punishes this, this servant for not showing mercy. And that's this, this parable of the unforgiving giving servant. And this parable shows us this, that forgiveness is an integral part of, of mercy. Because it's this word, alios. So, so Jesus is painting a picture. What does alios look like? It looks like forgiveness. It, it, it's not this vague idea of kindness, but, but it's letting go of the wrong. Letting go of that person who's just cut in front of you. Right? And now you're going to show them by driving really close behind them. <laughs> okay. I'll show them. Right? Lord, I just pray, may you just forgive people in this room? <laughs> it's been, God has been working on me, and, and I think I've done well. In my driving, he's really, it's been a work in progress. has been, anyway, let's keep working, moving. I love the quote from, from Bishop Desmond Tutu. If you know Bishop Desmond Tutu, he's this renowned South African bishop. He's a man who, who's experienced apartheid. He's experienced the horrors and he's, and he's seen the tragedy himself within his, his church members and, and, and lived in a society like this. This is what he said. He said, there is no future without forgiveness. There is no future without forgiveness. Wow. When you're being treated as second-rate citizens, when you're being treated, uh, when you're being forgotten or treated as being invisible, he's like, there is no future without forgiveness. Um, Bishop Desmond Tutu, you should read up about him. He's an incredible man. When the Hebrew scriptures were translated into Greek, because uh, if you're familiar with history, there's a man by the name of Alexander the Great who went and conquered the known world. And uh, as he did, he, he all of a sudden, um, he Hellenized the whole area. Now he brought Greek art, their culture, and then their language. And everyone was speaking Greek. Everyone had this, this, um, this Greek form. It's kind of like English. English is this aggressive language that takes over, right? It's very, we went to Europe in the beginning of the year and everyone spoke, spoke English, right? It's just, so Greek was very much like that back then. And, and so a lot of the Jews who were, who were dispersed around the known world, they were, they were afraid that their, their children, they, weren't, they didn't speak Hebrew. 
and they were speaking Greek. And so they began this work. They started in, in, the, in the third, third BC, third century uh, BC, uh, third century BC of translating the Hebrew scriptures into Greek known as the Septuagint. Now there's this Hebrew word called hesed. Hesed is this, this, this meat that, that talks about God's character with this one word, hesed, that of this loyal love, this, this compassionate love of God. And, it, and it's so deep and, and, it's, and it, there's a lot of words within this word hesed. So when they came to translating hesed into Greek, the word they chose was alios. Alios, the same word that Jesus used for mercy. So when we read Exodus chapter 34, verse 6, Exodus chapter 34, verse 6, if you've been part of our church for over a year, you're familiar with this verse because I preached a whole series on this. It's about the character of God. God reveals his character. So this is the first time he reveals his character to his people. And he's speaking to Moses. And in Exodus chapter 34, verse 6, God's revealing his character to Moses. And, and he passed in front of Moses proclaiming, Yahweh, Yahweh, compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in loyal love and faithfulness. And abounding in loyal love is this word hesed, hesed. And so in the Septuagint, it gets translated as alios, alios, which is really interesting because when Jesus employs the same term, alios, when he declares blessed are the merciful, by doing so, he draws upon this rich biblical tradition of mercy, pointing to a mercy that reflects God's character. A mercy not limited to forgiveness, but overflowing with loyal love, active compassion. Now, the question is, 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 is Jesus just talking about forgiveness or is he loading this Greek word alios with its Hebrew meaning of hesed? So when, when we continue to read the narrative within Matthew, Gospels Matthew, alios gets called upon again by those who are, who are, who are desperate, who are in desperate need of healing or help. Like, for instance, a blind, a blind man who calls out to Jesus in Matthew chapter 9, verse 27, he says this, Have mercy on us, son of David. Have alios on us, son of David. So this blind man, why does he want Jesus to show mercy? Because he's blind. He wants to see. Or, or, or in Matthew chapter 15, verse 22, when a Canaanite woman whose daughter is afflicted by a demonic spirit, she begs Jesus. She says, have alios on me, Lord. Have mercy on me, Lord. Now, in English, it kind of sounds weird because it sounds like when they say, have mercy on me, it kind of sounds like that we're asking God to forgive us for something we've done, but they're not asking for forgiveness. They're asking for compassion. They're asking, they're asking for healing. Which is really interesting. So, so they're pleading for compassion and healing, a kind of familial love that goes beyond obligation. The nuance suggests that alios in the beatitude goes beyond mere forgiveness but it reflects the rich concept of hesed, loyal love. It's a call to treat others as if they are family. That's what this is, giving an understanding. What does it mean, mercy, to treat others as family? See, if you ever encountered someone sitting out a supermarket with a sign for help, you know, you, you, you may lend them, give them a dollar or, or a tin of corned beef <laughs> or something like that. You may do that, but imagine this. Imagine you're going up to, to the supermarket. So there's a person holding a sign there, and as you get closer, you, you're beginning to realize something. It's your daughter who's there with the sign. It's your son who's there with the sign. It's your dad. It's your mom that's holding a sign. And, and let me tell you something. Your response would be profoundly different. You're not just going to give them a dollar and walk on or pretend they're invisible and walk in. No, 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 no. You're going to be picking them up. Are you okay? You're going to provide for their needs. You're going to care for them to make sure they get the adequate treatment they need. And this is the idea of what Jesus is saying for mercy, that we don't treat people as if they're invisible, but we treat them like they're family. Hugely challenging passage in the Bible. Hugely challenging. It's not just about doing what's convenient, but it's about embodying a love and a loyalty that mirrors God's mercy for us, because this is what God did for you. Elias, Elias carries the idea of relational loyalty. See, in Jesus' view, this is what it means to be an image of God. It means to love God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. 
This is the ultimate form of what humanity looks like. It's the highest expression of humanity to love God and to love people. It's the highest form of the expression of humanity. I mean, Jesus, Jesus, uh, when you read the narrative of Matthew and you get to Matthew chapter 12, Jesus and the disciples, they're walking through a grain field and his, and his disciples begin to eat the heads of grain. And the Pharisees, the teachers of the law, or the, the religious police, they begin to say, hey, 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 look, your disciples, they're working on a Sabbath. You're not meant to work on a Sabbath. And so and I'm, I'm just going to cut it short. But Jesus says to them, and he quotes the prophet Hosea. And he says, God desires mercy, not sacrifice. God desires alios, not sacrifice. He's not saying that sacrifice is bad. After all, God instituted it in, in the Leviticus law, in the book of Leviticus. But what he's saying is that mercy outweighs ritual. If you're choosing between offering a sacrifice or serening yourself as an act of generosity towards someone, God is saying choose love every time and offer the sacrifice later. See, what God desires is less about ritual aimed at Him and more about extending loving kindness to others. It's less about ritual, but it's more about um, extending loving kindness to others. See, this is how we live out our true devotion with God, right? Our devotion to God is revealed in, in how we care for others. Our devotion to God is revealed in how we care for others. That's what the good life looks like. It's not about like, hey, I come to church every Sunday. I'm a good person. That's cool, but look how you're treating your wife. Look how you're treating your husband. Look how you're treating your kids. Look how you're choosing, treating your co-worker. Cool, cool, you're, you're turning up on a Sunday, but you're not treating others right. You're not showing alios. The good life belongs to those who embody hesed. This is, this is the kind of loyal, outrageous love that treats others like family. The good life belongs to those who embody hesed. The kind of love, the outrageous love that treats others like family. So how do we live this out? So what does this look like? What does this look like? Think about your life right now. Think about your circle, whatever your circle looks like. Your colleagues, your family, whatever. Who's in your circle? People you don't like, they're in your circle. Every single one of them. Who is in your circle that needs mercy from you? Is it that coworker who's dropped the ball on a project now you've got to pick up the pieces? Or is it that family member who's hurt you and haven't apologized? Oh, that's hard. Or maybe it's that person you pass by every day, you know, the one holding the sign and, and you just pretend they're invisible. See, showing mercy doesn't always come naturally. It can be inconvenient, uncomfortable, or just downright costly. Forgiving a debt, letting go of a grudge, or offering a helping hand to someone who can't repay you. Sometimes it can feel like too much. But when we act with mercy, we mirror the very heart of God. Mercy challenges us to see people differently. That's what it does. It challenge, mercy challenges us the way we see our co-workers, our family members, people in our community, people who are marching on the streets. Mercy changes the way we see. We, we don't see people as burdens. They're not burdens. They're not an irritation. This person's already irritating me at work, whatever it is. But what mercy does is we begin to see them as family. As family. As people made in the image of God, it means asking ourselves if, as, as if they're my child, that they're my, if they're my sibling, my parent, how would I treat them? Because our devotion to God is revealed in how we care for others. You know, um, We've been senior pastor of this church now for over eight and a half years. 
eight and a half years. And uh, I was thinking about sharing this story, but it's like, it's been five years since this incident. And I thought, well, this is long enough. I can share this story. And about three years in as senior pastors, um, some very close friends, very close friends of ours, um, they left our church and they started their own church. And it wasn't on good terms, not on good terms at all. You can read between the lines, whatever you want. And a whole bunch of people from our church left us to join them. And if I'm honest with you, I felt very betrayed. But I, tr- I try to give it to the Lord, <laughs> give it to God. But every time someone mentions something about it, it ch- I got triggered. <laughs> we all know what this, we get triggered, right? And I fasted, I prayed, I <laughs> did all that I could. I tried to move past it, but something will continue to trigger this resentment. Here's the thing, a year after they launched their church, their church closed. It was only open for a year and it closed. And when I've, when I found the, out the news that their church had closed, and to be honest, I felt good. Vindicated even. But oh, the Holy Spirit. Oh my goodness, the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, when it just gets on to you, it begins to, began to convict me deeply. Holy Spirit was like, that's not right. Right there, that's not right. And here's the thing, you know, if, we're, if we are all honest in this room, we've all been there. I mean, how many of us have secretly felt satisfaction when the person we're at odds with face hardship? If we're honest, right? It's, it's not something we like to admit, but it's real. It's a real emotion that we feel. I hope it's okay to be real this morning. So I picked up the phone and I called them and I said, hey, can we have coffee? And as we sat down, they looked at me curious and, and with a little caution, a bit cautious about it. And they're wondering, what's this all about? And, and I just looked them in the eye and I said, I'm here to ask for your forgiveness. And they were like, what? What do, you, what do you mean? And I said, for the way that I thought about you and for the way that I felt towards you, can you please forgive me? This is not what forgiveness is. This, uh, let me tell you what forgiveness does not look like. It's not like you're calling a meeting to ask for forgiveness. Then you begin to list your litany of wrong. You begin to list, oh, this is how you, can you please forgive me? But you did this to me. You treated me like this. Uh, you did this to me. You did that, did this. And, and by the way, can you forgive me? That's not forgiveness. That's vindication. Vindication disguised as forgiveness. It's not forgiveness at all. It's a place for you to vent so you can get your justice. That's not forgiveness. I wasn't there for an apology and I wasn't there to to, to say you had wrong. None of that. I was there to say, please forgive me for my heart attitude towards you. And you know what? They said, absolutely. And can you please forgive us? Right there and there, we reconciled. See, mercy is more than just a one-time act. It's a posture of the heart. It's messy, very messy. And it's not always easy. But it's in those moments God teaches us what love truly looks like. Mercy is costly, but it's worth it because it reflects God's heart. See, I had to let go of my pride. I had to let go of my pain the sense of of justice that I thought I deserved. But in giving mercy, I received something greater. Freedom. Some people in this room, you haven't felt freedom for a while because you're waiting for vindication. Justice. God wants you to be free. And it starts with, blessed are the merciful. Alias. For they will be shown alias. You know, mercy, you know know what mercy does? It heals relationships, restores brokenness, 
it invites God to break through in our life. Because our devotion to God is revealed in how we care for others. Who in your life needs mercy from you? Who needs to hear, I forgive you, with no strings attached? Let's be people who don't just talk about mercy, but live it out. Treating others with the same loyal, outrageous love God has shown us. Imagine what our families, our communities, our world could look like if we let mercy lead the way. We become people who treat strangers like family, who forgive even when it's hard, who love with outrageous generosity. That's the kind of world Jesus invites us to create together. Our devotion to God is revealed in how we care for others.